The release of the Auschwitz report is headline news throughout the country. These news reports explaining to the American people what Auschwitz was and what happened there are followed up by op-eds, by columns about Auschwitz and what America has to do in the wake of all of this information. Fully two-thirds of European Jews were killed by the Nazis during World War II in a systematic, relentless process that continues to exceed our ability to comprehend its origins and consequences. The final solution, which was the Nazi plan to exterminate all European Jews, wasn't implemented until 1942, but Hitler's government had begun openly dehumanizing, harassing, and attacking Jews nine years earlier. Even when the Nazi death machine kicked into high gear, America mostly kept its doors closed to Jews, as filmmakers Ken Burns, Lynn Novick, and Sarah Botstein recount in The U.S. and the Holocaust, a three-part documentary series on PBS. The anxieties about urbanization, about unlettered, untutored, relatively uneducated peoples coming in in large numbers, the sense that disease was a problem all of these worries were amalgamated into a belief that immigrants caused these problems, and thus immigration should be held down. Some lobbied to open the country to refugees in the run-up to war, but anti-immigration legislation, the economic devastation of the Depression, incredulity toward a press that had trafficked in false atrocity accounts during World War I, and deep-seated anti-Semitism, especially in Franklin Roosevelt's State Department, combined to thwart those efforts. Reason talked with Burns and Novick about why a nation of immigrants remains so deeply ambivalent about newcomers and the lessons that 21st century America should draw from our country's response in the lead up to the Holocaust. Lynn Novick, Ken Burns, thanks for talking to Reason. Thank you for having us. So the series begins in uh, in the early 30s, and it's actually, you're talking about Otto Frank, who is known to everybody as the father of Anne Frank and kind of the, the person who brought the diary to notice. But it's in Frankfurt, and Otto Frank is, you know, what you're talking about is his plans, his thwarted plans to bring his family to America. Why is it so important that uh, you know you start the series with this question of Otto Frank not being able to bring his family to the United States at the very beginning of the Nazi era? You know, we started out to make a series about the United States and the Holocaust and what was our relationship to what was happening in Europe and what did we as Americans know and what did we do about it just collectively. And we, it, while we were working on the film, which has been many years in the making, mm -hmm. some documents came to light that showed Otto Frank and Frank's father writing to friends in the United States asking for help to get here. Right. And that was just extraordinary for us to recognize that the story of Anne Frank, we thought, or I'll speak for myself, but I think most of us felt this yeah. was a story about the Holocaust that happened over there, mm -hmm. had nothing to do with America. Right. And here's the, one of the most recognizable stories of the Holocaust has a lot to do with America. So we decided to frame our film around that idea by telling the story of Otto Frank and his efforts to get to America to help mm -hmm. our audience sort of see themselves in this story. And in 1933, it's the Depression. It's about a decade after the Johnson Reed Act, yeah. which um, was a, the culmination of 40 years of legislative activism or activism to shut down immigration, particularly from Central and Southern Europe. Yeah. Um, why, why is immigration you know, you know what what's going on with the way immigration was restricted a decade before when you know, during the Roaring Twenties. How does that factor into what's going on next? So there are two important things about immigration. One is symbolic. Like, what kind of country are we? You know, are we the Emma Lazarus, give us your tired, your poor, a nation of immigrants, mm -hmm. or are we an almost equal reaction to that? No, let us stop this. So between 1870 and 1920. Millions and millions of people come from areas that are threatening to the Protestant majority, and they right. want to figure out a way to go back 
to a um, an earlier time, right. always impossible. And when it was a dominant, there was a fear was that these newcomers who were from Central and Southern Europe, Catholic and Eastern Europe, uh, Catholic and Jews, would, would they be replacing us? Right. And so the Johnson-Reed Act is an attempt to set, essentially set quotas from the countries, the minuscule quotas from the countries that are less desirable and bigger quotas of people from the Northern right. European uh, Who things. ironic, or not ironically, but are not emigrating in the numbers where, you know, so Germany gets big quotas, but not that many people are coming. And then places like Italy get very low quotas and a lot of people want to move here. That's exactly right. So what we have is a kind of uh, as, as the situation in Nazi Germany develops over the course of the 30s, you get a, a terrible, terrible bottleneck, which is you have got a lot of people, particularly Jews, who are trying to leave the ever-expanding German area, Germany and then the Rhineland, then Germany, the Rhineland, and Austria, and then the Sudetenland and Czechoslovakia. And we are uh, saying, no, you can't come in. And right. so you've got all this space to let others in, but you don't have space to let the people yeah. who most desperately need to get out. And so just our Johnson Reed Act is going to contribute significantly to the fact that the United States mm -hmm. isn't going to be able to do what I believe they should have done, mm -hmm. which is let in 10 times more people right. than they did. And that would have been an important, important aspect. We could have absorbed them. We could have taken them. But it's also the depression. Yeah. The demagogues are out there, right. uh, anti-Semitic demagogues. People say these mm -hmm. people are here to take your jobs. They're already a conspiracy of Jews to mm -hmm. control absolutely everything. The New Deal is not the New Deal. It's the Jew Deal. Right. Franklin Roosevelt, who is, you know, for some people, the enemy because he's anti-Semitic, is in fact called Rosenfeld because right. it's presumed he's a Jew by the anti-Semites. So you have a very um, kind of um, tragic dynamic going mm -hmm. on in the United States that is going to ensure that the place that is able to accept so many people is not right. going to do that and you compound the humanitarian crisis. And it's also the, the Johnson Reed Act or the Immigration Acts that were passed in the 20s um, are the culmination of a kind of mental map or a reimagining of American, not just American identity, but human identity. And you, you guys uh, go over the work of Madison Grant, who's known for writing a book called The Passing of the Great Race, who comes up with this kind of crazy schema of Nordics, Alpines, and Mediterraneans, um, which then influences. So, I mean, not only that influences the laws in America that keep people out from undesired countries, but it also influenced Hitler and the Nazis. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I think he's looking at the United States and he's saying, look, you've handled your native problems so well. You've gotten rid of them or you've mm -hmm. isolated them into essentially big concentration camps. Mm -hmm. He hasn't yet devised that, that system. Right. He thinks the Johnson Reed Act is terrific because it's favoring his ideal of an Aryan uh, race. I right. mean, this is the absurdity of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, the mm -hmm. Russian hoax that gets promulgated by Henry Ford. It's the insanity of eugenics, the pseudoscience, and the insanity of Madison Grant that there is any kind of distinctions based on race or ethnicity or nationality between people. There's one race, it's the human race, right. and that's it. Everything else is an attempt by people to other somebody else right. and for you know, the United States, it's black people, it's its native people, it's immigrants uh, and Jews. And for most of the world, it's some variety of that, Catholics mm -hmm. in some cases in the United States earlier. Uh, but it's also um, Jews have had this experience right. because they are stateless for millennia. Mm -hmm. And they are always the groups that have come in and helped organize things in a civilized sense, but they run counter to the tribal uh, sensibilities that people often return to in times of stress or under the influence of authoritarian demagogues. The question of refugees is also interesting because from the inception of uh, certainly of the Johnson Reed Act and there were refugee situations you know prior to World War II or prior to the 30s when people are looking to get out particularly of uh, Nazi dominated parts of Europe um, what was the attitude towards refugees, kind of the official attitude towards refugees? And where does that come from? Because it's, it's a subset of questions about whether you're pro or anti-immigration, but we've had a, and we still struggle with this today, a very vexed relationship with the idea of refugees. Well, 
it was instructive for us to understand the distinction in our foreign policy between immigrants and refugees. So immigrants, we think of, are people who are coming to live here, to move here, to resettle here. Refugees would be, in theory, people who are fleeing persecution or in imminent peril, and we would take them in for a while, mm -hmm. and then they would theoretically be able to go back to where they came from when the conflict was over. Mm -hmm. That was sort of the general idea. The United States did not have a refugee policy during this period. Mm -hmm. So there was just this immigration system that Ken was talking about with the quotas from country to country. There was a lot of talk in the, in the you know, in the press and in politics about refugees and that these people are desperate and they need help. But there was no special exception made in this sort of immigration policy for people who would just come here temporarily. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was also, as the sort of situation devolved, uh, a growing fear that immigrants slash refugees who came from Germany or from Nazi occupied Europe were a threat, mm -hmm. that they would undermine our uh, national security. Right. The, fifth, the column. fifth column. Right. right. So these yeah. are people who you let them in and then they, they sleeper cells, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of idea that we're familiar with. That was very much a fear then. Mm -hmm. And there were German spies in the U.S. for sure. And we had spies in other places. Spying is part of, you know, human conduct. But the idea that Jewish refugees fleeing Hitler would become the most dangerous threat to right. America. So that we had to essentially keep them out virtually completely. Keep everybody out. Yeah. In other words, like we can't let any of these people in because some yeah. of them might be spies. Right. You know, I understand, I think we appreciate the fear yeah. at the time, but there's also fear mongering. Right, no, and there's a, a dark, I mean, the Holocaust and certainly a lot of Jewish writing coming out of it is, you know, the darkest humor. But, you know, at the same time, we're worried about Jewish refugees, like, Nazi spies coming in on them. There's a growing Bund movement, yeah. which is openly pro-Nazi, not right. even pro-German. Or anything. The, this yeah, is the no absurdity kidding. of all of that. And yeah. I think that, that they're historical antecedents because remember, mm -hmm. so many of the people in the big wave of immigrants um, were Catholic and right. Italian and, and, and Central and Eastern European. Right. And they're often fleeing persecution or abject mm -hmm. poverty and would qualify really in the kind of refugee as well as immigrant mm -hmm. status, right? right? And they're now, with regards to the Bolshevik res revolution, they're now all right. communists. So what you have is... So you're fleeing communism, but you can't come to America because, because you're, you're a, a communist. communist. Right. Yeah. And, that you're, um, and you're fleeing pogroms that have right. been taking place, but because you are Jewish and because communism is now being right. equated by the Madison Grants and the Henry Fords as, as equal, communist, the Jews bringing communism, uh, that they're responsible for the Soviet Union's collapse. You just have this conflating of all of that yeah. and you have the poverty and the worry that people are just here, they're not like us. Right. And that's, that's the, that's and the this big is distinction. The Schrodinger's immigrant, this is a popular meme that exists to today, that yeah. immigrants are simultaneously coming here and they're just going to live off of us because they're lazy well, okay. and they Can take I, welfare, the or, or they're coming here may, and stealing our jobs. May I same. tell you that in the middle of the 18th century, Benjamin yeah. Franklin lamented the arrival in Pennsylvania of the swarthy Germans. Right. And that he and you wanted to keep Pennsylvania for the lovely white and red, right. meaning the people whose land we were already stealing and dispossessing yeah. and killing were now being romanticized yeah. along with the white race that should be there. And that somehow the Germans, who would yeah. later suggest that they were the <laughs> epitome of the white race, right. were somehow swarthy and not desirable. Yeah. He wanted to keep He may have been onto something there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, now that history is revealed. So, well, it also brings up, you know, one of the antecedents. So you have this immigration policy and a, and a set of mindsets, plus the, you know, uh, economic realities of, of the depression going on. Also, America's um, uh, experience in World War I. Um, that's also important. And you talk about that as a precursor to all of this. What, you know, by the early 30s, what was what were people thinking about World War One and America's relationship to it? And how did that affect how we thought about what was starting to happen in Europe? Well, I think um, there was a lot of anti-German propaganda during World War One mm -hmm. to get people motivated to go over there and fight. And a lot of it was later proven to be untrue. It's grossly yeah. exaggerated talk of atrocities. And so there was that memory that we were lied to by the government, right. the government office that created this propaganda. You know, mm -hmm. so that, that sets up a dynamic where 
people are very suspicious of the government wanting to get us into a war, especially right. after we've been promised we're not going to get into the war. You know, for the first few years of World War One, Americans mm -hmm. weren't right. told they weren't going to yeah. have to worry I about mean, it. I um, mean, right? Wilson yeah. won by saying he kept us exactly. out of war. Exactly, and then a year later, okay, now yeah. now we have to get yeah. in. So. You know, that's not that long ago when mm -hmm. we're talking about the 30s. Um, and there were even hearings, I, I don't remember exactly, but the late 30s, right, about mm -hmm. this war profiteering. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the sense of corruption and being lied to and the sort of the mm -hmm. government not being trusted to get, keep us out of war is very potent by the time mm -hmm. this... 70, 70 or 80 percent of the think that World War One is a mistake. Right. right. And so you've also got a large German population in the United yeah. States that's been villainized, right? You've right. helped to pass prohibition by making right. the German brewers the kind of the enemies right. and the Along internal, with the immigrants subs, who, along yes. the who immigrants are drinking, right? Who yeah. want yeah. to drink, whereas yeah. us uh, abstemious Protestants don't right. need the that. We can give up the bottle and what we're anxious about are Catholics yeah. with their sacrament, blacks with their yeah. bottle of booze and yeah. Yeah. and the ballot and so you're trying to regulate and eugenics is a perfect example mm -hmm. of how you can in a scientific way justify these kinds of absurd theories but what it does is it just creates others people right. that aren't us even though yeah. we're all us and it it becomes complicated as we move forward because world war ii is a radically different war than world war one right right yeah. i mean there is a strong argument still to say like you know the united states could have it could have gone in equally on either side. In World um, War One, yeah, World yeah, War right. One, and you know it really wasn't our fight. I mean, that's it's it's a more powerful argument. Yes, um, but that that's very much. In but not place. that those sentiments aren't there. There's great yeah. German sympathy. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Henry Ford is going to pass yeah. up a contract to make uh, military things for the Brits and mm -hmm. instead takes a contract uh, with the Germans. People are interested in not you know, choosing sides uh, yeah. or favoring perhaps what they think is going to be the winner. Right. I mean, because more, more people are descended from Germans than any other ethnic group, I think still, but certainly at that point in America. Joe Kennedy, who's the ambassador yep. to the court of St. James said it best. He says, you know, Britain is doomed, mm -hmm. right? He's sure that, that Britain cannot survive right. the, the, the power of Hitler. So there's really a question of let's be on the right, let's stay out of this, but let's be on the right side mm -hmm. if we, it, you know, at the end. Yeah. And, and that, that makes this uh, very, very complicated for a time. But, but this is a totally different war. Right. And this is a war based on, uh, you know, they're both after German expansion, but mm -hmm. the other one is based on these racial theories of mm -hmm. finding the Liebenstrom, the breathing right. room, so that you have to treat the Slavic people as not people. Right. Stateless people whose territory, like Native Americans, this is not their land. They're just they're just occupying. Right. It. There's no there's no sense of a of a political entity that gives them. These are people that don't really deserve passports. Mm -hmm. And a passport is that piece of yeah. paper that identifies who you are. And so this is the area that we'll take. This will be our big bread basket right. that we can the German people, minus the Jewish Germans and right. Austrians and everybody else and one just very quickly one of the stats that you it comes up at several points but in europe uh, by the end of by 1945 two-thirds of jews are gone from europe they've been murdered uh, yeah. yeah 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 i was just going to add on to what ken was saying to say that you know the the um up until we got involved in the war the country was there were a lot of people here who admired hitler right and, you know, not just because the trains ran on time, certainly that the society was portrayed in the press. Mm -hmm. There's Christian Science Monitor and other mainstream publications saying this is a very well-run place. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, they, they sometimes go a little overboard, mm -hmm. you know, with um, sort of being too violent or oppressive. But basically, you know, this is a, a good example for us to follow. And right. we have the, the, the Olympics and the kind of big sort of stage managing of that. They're incredibly brilliant with the propaganda. So we look back and we see the evil and the depravity and the barbarity. But mm -hmm. at the time, you know, our nation wasn't 100 percent on board with that until the right. war kind of progressed. And that's also I mean, America at the time was kind of a mess. Right. Yeah. I mean, you right. know, uh, FDR did his bold, persistent experimentation, which kind of worked, kind of didn't. But there was a sense we needed some kind of structure and forward momentum well, that Hitler, Mussolini before him and then Hitler right. was delivering like uh, right in the 30s with the depression you have the sort of collapse of the global economy of mm -hmm. a certain 
order, right? So then is it going to be fascism? Is it going to be communism? Is right. it going to be democracy? Which of these systems is really going to prevail? And that's an open question in this country. Right. We, we focus on the mythology of the only thing you have to fear is fear itself, which yeah. is, if you think about it, not a, a really logical thing. No. It's no. an emotional yeah. truth, and we right. get it, and it was smart. But the real point of that speech is when he basically says, you know, I will ask Congress for the power to fight right. this economic emergency as if we were being attacked by a foreign enemy, right. which causes Eleanor to go, whoa, yeah. right. what do you mean? So there, there, there's a sense in, in 1933 as, as FDR is yeah. coming to power that maybe a democracy or the Western democracies as we understood it are ill-equipped to face this economic crisis. And the example of Mussolini and Hitler, kind of brutal authoritarian regimes, mm -hmm. Are the way to go, and there are people who are urging, you know, uh, Franklin Roosevelt to become a, a dictator, and he's understanding that it's going to take bold powers to do something, you know. And and uh, some somebody said to to Roosevelt early on, you're either going to be uh, the best president or the worst president. He said, if I don't succeed, I'll be the last president. Hmm. Um, let's dial in a little bit on the lack of trust in media. Um, and then a bit in government, but you were talking about the kind of propaganda stories that came out of World War One, and then were later kind of debunked or like, okay, we're, we're being played here um, because the government and media is kind of telling a story that may or may not be true. How did that work out in the early 30s? Because there, there, there are a number of people who are sounding the alarm early on. And, and this is also before certainly the mass killings began. Right. That's later in the decade or even in the 40s. But, um, you know, how, how were people consuming media at the time? It's basically, you know, three elements. Uh, you've got a newspaper, you've got a radio, and you've got newsreels mm -hmm. uh, on the weekends when you go to the movies on Saturday or Friday night. Yeah. Um, Americans are reading newspapers. There are, you know, the, the argument is that we didn't know uh, we knew there were 3,000 articles about kind of German uh, uh, treatment of Jews in the first, in 1933, mm -hmm. the first year. I mean, there's, there's coverage. Um, I would not overplay the, the suspicion about it. There's, mm -hmm. it, it is there, uh, but I think people trust it. They just, it's hard time to believe. And you're also distracted by so many mm -hmm. other things. The depression is the number one story of the 1930s. Mm -hmm. And so while you could say, oh boy, that's too bad mm -hmm. when you hear about the train crash in India or the mm -hmm. flood in Pakistan or whatever it might be, you're saying, you know, how am I going to get food on the table? Who's going to do this? Mm -hmm. And if they want to come here, does that take my job? And right. people are are accentuating that. There is alternative media in much mm -hmm. the same way there is here. There's Father Coughlin, there are people, right? there's Henry Ford with the yep. Dearborn Independent that's Which promoting. Which is the place that actually published the Protocols of the so, Elder in so, Zion. So Henry and, Ford yeah. is a virulent anti-Semite. Yep. He believes that Jews are responsible for the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. He buys the Dearborn Independent that grows to the second largest um, circulation. And he promotes this Russian hoax, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is, you know, just recounting the ancient sense of Jewish domination of everything, everything banking yeah. and, and whatever. And he prints it as the international Jewish conspiracy and over many, many weeks uh, and then publishes it a book. It's translated into languages, including German. So it, it has a, a kind of effect in the United States that I, I still think we hear the echoes and the and the reverberations of it today in the way you can have the kind of disassociative thinking that comes along with anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. you know, that they are conniving and they're smart and they're but bad smarts, as the mm -hmm. scholar Deborah Lipstadt says, mm -hmm. but they're also ugly and they're unattractive right. and they're mean-spirited, but they're also virile and they're going to take our women. Right. So you have... But then a, they're also a feat and, and they right. hire other people to do their work so for them. So you have it's, all of these, you know, incredibly racist tropes yeah. about Jews that just aren't true. And right. they persist to this day right. in the sense of, of, uh, of people just beginning to see it. You see it everywhere. Mm -hmm. You see it, you know, in the extreme left as well as yeah. the extreme right. Do you, it, you know, and this is a kind of an absurd question, but how much of the, in, in the run-up to a kind of American indifference to what was going on in Europe and to mm. the beginning of the Holocaust and then it 
It is that it's, well, it was because it's the Jews and there are not that many of them and they really are different than us. You know, whether we're Catholic or Protestant who, you know, hate each other, but sometimes they can be like, well, you know, but we are very different. We're categorically different than Jews. Mm -hmm. How much of it is just that if this had been happening to people in England or if it had been happening to the Irish, say, would we have responded the same way? That's a really good question. I don't know how to answer that. It, it is a little bit of a parlor yeah, discussion right, question. Right. What if the South had won yeah. the Civil War kind of thing? Um, I don't know. Jews have had a special relationship to humanity for a long right. time, a people without a country until mm -hmm. 1948. And so there is a sense of them bringing things that are unifying, that connect other mm -hmm. countries, a kind of globalist and internationalist yeah. thing, a sense of, as the scholar... Um, Peter Hayes says they have brought the notion of fair play and the golden rule. Mm -hmm. They've brought lots of right. ideologies that yeah, they are, simultaneously that are, bring Christianity but refuse to participate. Well, they they kind of have well, transnational yeah. things yeah. in them, and so they become a perfect scapegoat when mm -hmm. you've got an authoritarian person who wants to scapegoat right. somebody or to blame the ills or to return to the more simplistic but self-destructive. Um, aspects of nationalism, of tribalism, and things like that. Yeah. So it's hard to say. I, I think there would probably be more sympathy for the Irish, but you know, the the Jews have had this going yeah. on for millennia, literally, yeah, yeah. and and have heard all of this a million right. times. Whether it's Father Coughlin or you know a thousand yeah. years before Father Coughlin, there's a reason why you have to get rid of the Jews now because they're doing something. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I also I think you know it. It's hard to, to really generalize about the American public's response mm -hmm. to all of this, and it does tie into the questions of how it was covered in the media. And people could be concerned. Mm -hmm. Kristallnacht, which was this horrible pogrom mm -hmm. that happened, you know, out in the open on the streets of Germany, was front page news. Right. You know, it, it was it was it was an outrage around the world. Roosevelt made a statement. You know, there mm -hmm. was a sense of this is wrong. Yeah. So it's not indifference per se. Right. It's more. A sense of well, this is really wrong, but like Ken was saying, it, it happened over there. It's another catastrophe, another humanitarian mm -hmm. problem. We can't do anything, or you know, we right. have our own problems here. Right. So there's just a sense of recognizing it's wrong. Mm -hmm. I think probably most Americans yeah. did. Right. Even anti-Semitic Americans would probably recognize that you know you can't just go around beating people up in the street and right. burning down their houses and taking their stuff, you know, for no reason. But it's not really our problem. Right. Or we or we care, but. We have our own problems. So there's this, you know, it's, we tried in the film really to, to unpack the nuances of this mm -hmm. so that it helps, for at least for us, to understand all the things we have to deal with today. Right. Because we face the same challenges. Right. A photograph of a Syrian child drowned on a beach yeah. is horrible. But what are we going to do? Yeah. You know? Can you talk about uh, Rabbi Stephen Wise a little mm. bit? He's a figure who comes up and is a central figure in kind of um, motivating Americans to kind of give a shit about this. Who was he and what were what were some of his most successful efforts to bring attention to what was going on in, in Europe? In the well, 30s? I think that he is the most famous rabbi mm -hmm. in the United States by far, and apparently mail came to him just rabbi. You know, yeah, you USA. have that thing where the post office yeah. would deliver like letters to rabbi. Yeah. So and it would be like, oh, it's got to be would go yeah. to Stephen York. Yeah. And he took on himself and he seemed to carry the burdens, it seems, of the great dilemma, which was for American Jews and Jews in the rest of the world, the dilemma of if you speak out, do you imperil the Jews that are still in Germany? If you mm -hmm. don't speak out... Are you complicit in what is happening to the Jews mm -hmm. in Germany? And so he's, you can see it etched in his face. He does have, because of his renown, access to the White House. He's able to mm -hmm. speak out. He's brought information about the earliest uh, reports of the beginning of, of the, the decision to exterminate the Jews right. of Europe in the killing centers in Nazi-occupied Poland. It is buried by the State Department. Mm -hmm. It goes to a British... A member of parliament who gives it to Stephen Wise, he begins to go uh, public with it. So mm -hmm. he becomes the face, the sort of vanguard of information about how bad it's actually right. going to be. And it's really hard for anybody to get their minds around it because nobody could actually believe. You can see the sort of, you can understand, you know, what happens in a pogrom, you know, of, of mm -hmm. Kristallnacht. It's terrible and it's whatever. But the idea 
that a state would say, you know what, mm -hmm. we've got 11 million problems. Let's get rid of right. all of them. And that two th they're successful with two thirds. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they were successful. They el essentially eliminated the Jews of Europe and those that mm -hmm. survived got, for the most part, the hell out of there. Right. So Stephen Wise, I think, is, is f a way to understand one aspect of the American Jewish com communities. Mm -hmm. Um, anguish and their um, their desire to to try to do something to figure out what was the best thing yeah. and and you have I mean Kristallnacht itself is interesting it's not an American sponsored moment but you have a young stateless Polish Jew in Paris who kills a minor uh, foreign mm -hmm. service person in the German embassy and that's that's the pretext right. right. The, there's an international conspiracy. See, we told you. Mm -hmm. They're out to get us. So we're going to get them. And this is when things begin to transit from making their life difficult mm -hmm. and trying to get them to leave to beginning to say, right. maybe we just get rid of them. And this, I mean, is kind of at the heart of the series that, you know, at a certain point, Germany may have been amenable to just getting, letting or forcing Jews to leave. But they're not coming to the United States. They're well, not allowed in. They had all kinds of plans. That was really fascinating. Yeah. Different yeah. schemes, you know, some of them completely preposterous. Right. Madagascar and different things. Yeah. Just, we're going to just put people on boats and get them out of here, just right. deport them to different places. Um, and then you recount, I mean, the, the famous story of the, uh, the St. Louis, right. which is a ship of Jewish refugees that comes to the, the New World, comes to Cuba yeah. and America, and is just turned away. Yeah, well, we, we tried, that's a story that has come down with some understanding and some misunderstanding yeah. about what was really happening there. There were lots of ships. Mm -hmm. You know, we did have this quota system, and some people got here. So right. as in more than any other sovereign nation, mm -hmm. we led in 250,000. A lot of them came on boats. Right. So there were boats coming across the Atlantic before... America got involved in the war, you know, here. Yeah. And they had, people had to have visas and they had to have permission. It was really hard to get. So sometimes they would try to get to a different country and then hope mm -hmm. to get to America. Right. So the St. Louis was a ship of 900 and something refugees who had gotten visas to go to Cuba. Yeah. And the idea there was you get to Cuba and then you wait until your number comes up and you come to the United mm -hmm. States for most people. But you're safe. But right. you're safe. You're out right. of, right. You're yeah. exactly. So they, they get to Cuba. But when they get to Cuba, the Cuban government decides, you know what, we don't really mm -hmm. want you here and your visas don't count anymore, even though you bought them. Right. So now they're sitting there in Havana Harbor and you've got a whole media circus going on. You have relatives mm -hmm. coming to the ship. It gets a lot of attention and it kind of uh, symbolizes the whole yeah. refugee crisis. And here they're only 90 miles from them, mm -hmm. the United States. So, you know, why don't they just come here? Well, they don't have visas to come right. here. There's a quota system. There's all and you kinds. Have, you tell a heartbreaking story. Or, uh, I do, it, it's hard to even yeah. kind of put these in terms of a guy who saw the lights of Miami yeah. on the ship. And asked his dad And then it ends was. up. Yeah. Right. And he ends up in the United States. Yeah, and so, yeah. you know, and, and those points, I, I don't want to make too much art out of this story because that seems wrong. But mm. the series is filled with those kinds of moments that are, I, you know, are just re revelatory in, you a, know, in an amazing ar argument, way. Arguments don't work. Yeah. You don't change anybody's mind. Stories, mm -hmm. you do. Yeah. Stories, you have a thing. And if you've got a little boy asking his dad what the lights are there, and it's Miami, and now as an American Jew, having survived all of this in great dr dramatic fashion, right. by the way, mm -hmm. um, to, to have spent time in Miami yeah. and, and know what that's about is really important. What's missed in the St. Louis is what mm -hmm. Lynn is saying. First of all, there's not a there's no way that it can stop in the United States right. because of this right. Johnson Reed, this pernicious Johnson Reed Act. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, FDR is not a king. He can't wave a magic right. wand. It's Congress that would have to change it. And they are in no right. mind to do it. The interesting thing, though, is that the St. Louis sails back across heading to Germany. Its own German captain is thinking of running it aground mm -hmm. in a free country. And more importantly, the American Jewish Joint Distribution Community mm -hmm. co Committee comes up with the money necessary to, to essentially buy their entry right. into five nations, right. you, you know, Britain, France, Belgium. Yeah. Uh, so m those people go there. What's unfortunate and tragic is about a quarter of them are then killed when the Germans right. subsequently overrun their country of sanctuary. Right. Um, but it's 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 an instructive story of how much these tropes of the 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 Holocaust 
and the tropes of the Second World War get misunderstood. Mm -hmm. We we presume that there is therefore an essential anti-Semitism inherent in FDR, mm -hmm. who appoints more Jews than anyone else, that he doesn't help in this mm -hmm. regard, but he's doing many other things. He's not uh, he's a cold and calculating yeah. politician at times, and that looks kind of uh, doesn't look so good in, right. in retrospect. But that there are other sort of mitigating factors. That's what's so interesting about right. it is that you can take something in which people have a kind of superficial understanding mm -hmm. of it, and 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 more often than not, huge parts of that are misunderstandings, right. and complicate the story with what really actually happened. But let's complicate the story about the government too because the state department mm. is absolutely uh, i don't is it ideological anti-semitism or but there are people in the state department that's the correct way to say it there okay. are people in the state yeah. department who are who virulent are, anti semites yeah and and talk a little bit about that because that that's part of the reckoning right, right. that needs to be done exactly. if we're going to take american history seriously well, right. I mean, part of it is the culture of the State Department and the culture of official Washington and where it came from and who gets those jobs and, you know, sort of the power of the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant establishment, mm -hmm. if we want to call it that, you know, to, right. to run these institutions. And Roosevelt comes in and starts to shift things around. But still, the State Department, as we say, is hidebound. It's sort of, you know, this old fashioned kind of gentlemanly, courtly mm -hmm. environment of diplomacy and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, the people running it... Uh, are not focused on the refugee crisis. Mm -hmm. They're focused on international relations and, you know, not alienating the German government, for example, you know, before America gets involved in the war. So it's from the top down. There's not a sense that someone, you know, Cordell Hall running the State Department is saying, hey, you know, job right. one is let's let's relax the rules to get as many right. refugees here. Far from it. And but then, then you have Breckenridge Long, right. who's the head of the visa department, which is the, the agency, the part of the State Department that actually in the consulates around the world you go in to right. apply, and they're the ones, the guy sitting in front of you at the desk is going to say yes or no. Do you have all the paperwork? Right. Have you got everything in order? Now, you know, do they have to follow the letter of the law to every single I dot, dotted mm -hmm. and T crossed? I mean, And he was, maybe. yes, and he misrepresented. He's the black the, hole yeah. where information about the impending Holocaust goes to die, where information uh, about individuals mm -hmm. happen of... Uh, of a bureaucracy that then begins to change the rules. Many of the German and uh, Austrian Jews have connections to the Western mm -hmm. democracy and to the United States, and they have means, and they are fulfilling this obligation that you mm -hmm. not become a ward of the state, that you've got recommendations that there's amount of money, and Breckenridge Long and those of his ilk in the State Department are constantly changing the bar. So right. you will find somebody who's gotten all their stuff together, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden there's a new rule, and you kind of almost yep. have to press reset and do that. And that this is this is where the United States is incredibly uh, has to come to terms. Yeah, with it, is, has to and, and, and we didn't fill the quotas that we had. Right. Even. This right. is the amazing thing. Yeah. So we take yeah. in 225,000 human beings more than right. any other sovereign nation, but we got so much space. It would be in sports salary cap. We have right. so much space mm -hmm. right. that we could have brought in at least five following times that number, that right. following right. the rules that we had, yeah. had it not been for the kind of perfidy of the State Department, right. individuals in the State Department. And it's going to take a Treasury Department starting the War Refugee Board mm -hmm. run by Henry Morgenthau, who is Jewish and a friend of Roosevelt's, mm -hmm. to be able to do it. And even then, State Department kills that for months and months and months. Mm -hmm. And finally, it happens, and it becomes the most effective organization in saving Jewish mm -hmm. lives in the story of the Holocaust. But finally, it takes us so long and so mm -hmm. late to get started that you've already lost more than three quarters, probably more than 80% right. of That's the people who are going to be late. murdered in the Holocaust have already been murdered by the time the War Refugee yeah. Board gets one started. Of, yeah. uh, one of the uh, uh, historians uh, that's in the documentary, a fair amount, Peter Hayes, talks mm -hmm. about how the speed with which, the, the time when people were being killed right. is yeah. immensely compressed. Yes. It's it is. 18 months or 20 right. months or something yeah, like that's that. That's so shocking in a way. It's how, how easy it was for them to actually actually do this. Yeah. How um, how did people respond or how did the how did the American government and the American people respond once it became clear, uh, you know, the Vonsi conference where the final solution is kind of promulgated is in the beginning of 1942. By the end of that year, people are taking it seriously mm -hmm. yes. or more so like 
what happened to get people to kind of say like, okay, this, you know, forget the, the World War One propaganda, this, this is real. these stories which sound kind of similar, this is happening on, on a much greater scale. How, do, how did that perception flip? Yeah, that was that was what, what Ken was talking about, Stephen Wise, and there was a, the World Jewish Congress in, in Switzerland was collecting data or evidence mm -hmm. from um, people who came out of the Polish underground to describe what was happening. Because remember, this is happening mm -hmm. largely pretty far away from the Western world, right? So, right. This, you know, yeah, I think Hayes also talks about how all a lot of what this where this was happening was not reachable by allied forces. Yeah, but it, there's an even more thing is that there's a, that Hayes brings up that's really important to understand to set that set, help set this in motion is that Hitler wants to get rid of the Jews, mm -hmm. right? He wants them yeah. out of there. And in more than half of German Jews, 560,000, more than half of Austrian Jews, 190,000, do get out, mm -hmm. right? But as he keeps assuming territory, right. he's got a huge problem, which is as, as he's getting his breathing room in Poland, 3.3 .3 million mm -hmm. Jews, and Lithuania, and Latvia, and Belarus, mm -hmm. and Ukraine, and the Soviet Union, it's just astronomical numbers, and mm -hmm. then you realize we're not going to take over Britain right away. Mm -hmm. We can't take their navy and ship them all to Madagascar where we can starve all the Jews right. to death. Insane plan, right? Mm -hmm. We're just going to murder them. And so what happens is, and what was a revelation for me, was the Shoah by bullets, mm -hmm. in which there are two million Jews that are just shot in the head and put yeah. in pits all over mm -hmm. Pol uh, Nazi-occupied Poland and Ukraine mm -hmm. and all of these places. And, it, and it's just, it's before anybody has mentioned the word gas. Right. And so I think that when you say Holocaust, you think six million, it's very opaque. You mm -hmm. can't particularize, as the writer Daniel Mendelssohn says in our film, what that means. But he takes his own family, his great uncle mm -hmm. and great aunt and their four daughters, and finds out what happens to them. He right. spends a great deal of, of his professional life di delving into what happened, going to Soviet mm -hmm. records and things like that. And only one of them. The mother is killed by gas. Everybody else is killed in another way, mostly right. in atrocities that are almost unspeakable when you think about these four yeah. teenage girls. So yeah. it's 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 an amazing um, it's it's an amazing mm -hmm. context to understand that that the Holocaust is really we just don't have time to get them out of here. We can just kill them, mm -hmm. and let's figure out the most efficient way to do that. And all, for the American story, all of that's happening before we have boots on the ground. Right. right. So essentially, yeah. you know, it's what we could have done was to help people get out before all this happened. Right. right. Once it started happening, we really, we, the United States, was not in a position militarily if we yeah. wanted to. Not to say that we did, but even if we had wanted to, we're nowhere right. near these places. Our planes can't get there. Yeah. We're not, we don't have, so, we're, you know, we're way, we're in North Africa mm -hmm. when this is happening. So um, it's just, we have to line up all the information to kind of, if we want to critique our policy and our government's interaction. Right. It's not about that. That by the time mm -hmm. that happened, yeah, you know, it was. And, and, and you could say, you know, you can debate whether you should bomb the rail lines to Auschwitz, yeah, right. you know, right. where the right. rail lines could be replaced overnight, or do you want to bomb, make a mistake? Or imprecise mm -hmm. bombing would have probably killed prisoners and did mm -hmm. when we missed a plant five miles away. Eighty percent of of bombs dropped in Europe fell outside five miles mm -hmm. from their intended target. Five so miles. Far. Five miles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eighty percent of all bombs. Okay, let it go. Yeah, is outside of the target for all the obvious reasons, imprecise mm -hmm. uh, calculations, but also fear. And let's get rid of. Let's drop yeah. it and get out of here. Let's go home. Um, pilot crews were dying, and the American public would probably not stand for yeah. the idea that you were diverting resources from winning the war to going right. to do what? Bomb right. a rail line to Auschwitz. But the most important thing is the War Refugee Board. Mm -hmm. That in the last places where the where the remaining Jews are, that you can do something about right. in Hungary and Romania, that's where they have their thing. And so Raoul Wallenberg, mm -hmm. the celebrated Swedish diplomat, right. feels that he's he's funded by the War Refugee Board, and he feels that he's part of of an American program, mm -hmm. as do others in the community, the international community in 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 uh, Romania and Hungary, particularly Hungary. And so it's it's a pretty interesting thing that the tens of thousands of lives mm -hmm. that Rollenberg, we credit Rollenberg with saving, and others, mm -hmm. really important diplomats from other countries, yeah. Switzerland uh, notably, are are basically being underwritten 
by the War Refugee Board, which is an attempt to step outside the guidelines of the United States and flood the zone with money right. for forgeries and for bribes and yeah. for things like that. It's a good. It's a. It's one of the few places right. where you can find like the various uh, committees, like the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society mm -hmm. and the YMCA and the Fr American Friends Service and the individuals who just pack up their lives right. and go to save other human beings. That's mm. that's the points of light that exist in this story in the midst of what we consider the darkest moment mm. in humanity's yeah. history. Um, uh, after uh, the war is won and um, you, there's, there's in one of the final episodes or the final episode, um, you quote Eisenhower as saying like Eisenhower tours a couple of the death mm -hmm. camps and he um, says to, you know, broadly to soldiers or saying something and I'm paraphrasing a bit like you may not know what you were fighting for but you now know what a you were soldier, fighting against. A GI against. giggles nervously yeah. at the horror that they're looking at. What the was Eisenhower, like. what, what does that mean to say you might not know what you were fighting for? He said, we hear that the GI doesn't know what he's fighting for. Mm -hmm. At least now, maybe perhaps you know what you're fighting against. He's talking about the Willie and Joe from Bill right. Maldon, the guys mm -hmm. who were in the trench, and you're yeah. just there for your buddies, and you know that everything is foobar and snafu, and, right. and that the bureaucracy mm -hmm. of the army is about as big as you can get. But there's now, he's suggesting, and, mm -hmm. and, wrote, and Eisenhower is incredibly great, on all of this, yeah. and his writings, the formal writings, not just the anecdotal right. stuff, are are amazing. He he insists that a congressional <clears throat> delegation comes. He insists yeah. that newspaper editors come and look for themselves. He insists that commanders send their troops in their off times to these camps and look and see. Right. And it has a profound effect on many many Americans mm -hmm. who visit there and begin to understand what it was about. Yeah. And and it's uh, it's to Eisenhower's credit, Absolutely. I think that he. Yeah, I, I, that I, he what I found. Can, can I just, yep. One of the things we found working on a film on the Second World War and now this project was, you know, what was told to the American public about what we were fighting for, mm -hmm. the four freedoms. It was yeah. pretty abstract, really. Right. Nazism, you know, fascism, but I think um, when the camps were liberated, mm -hmm. it was kind of flipping. Yeah. To say, oh, that's what this means. Right. You know, it's not an abstraction. These people have been brutalized and killed and tortured, yeah. and we're fighting to stop this from happening. I and think both in this and certainly in your series on the, on World War II, what's powerful about it is that it it, it pulls back some of the gauze that has exactly. crept in with the whole Greatest well, Generation yeah. rhetoric, where everything everybody was united well, and we they had knew what they were well, doing. Yeah. First of all, yeah. we call that war the Good War. Right. Give me a break. It's yeah. the worst war ever. Right. We, we name our first chapter of that film a necessary war. Right. And that may be a better described by right. one of our, our pilots. Um, you know, it might be a better way of, right. of describing. Sometimes you know, this is what human beings do and sometimes yeah. this is a, a, a unavoidable. But once you have the evidence, I think it's important to say that really galvanizes a lot of mm -hmm. sense of purpose and helps to help, you know set in motion, I think, some of the mythology and the barnacles right. of sentimentality and nostalgia yeah. and the greatest generation that has encrusted it. But let's also remember that the Americans seeing the newsreels right. of all of that, the proof now, the ovens right. and the concentration clans, the crematoria, all of that stuff, 5% of Americans want to add more refugees to the right. United States yeah, which after is it's over. There is a moment uh, where you show a newsreel and they're showing, they're opening up uh -huh. ovens that still have bodies in them or corpses and the, the narrator says, don't, don't turn look away. away. Yeah. Look, yeah. And I have to say, you know, like I've been yeah. watching this stuff for decades because, you know, this is what you do if you're interested in history in, you know, the last 70 years. And I was stunned by it because I was like, no, I want to look away. Yeah. Um, what goes into or, you know, what do you do with the fact that faced with this, with the documentary evidence of this mass murder, you know, uh, unthinkable, that it really didn't move the needle in terms of like people saying like, oh, yeah, let's let's 
you know, we you know we got lots of space here. Let's right. bring some more so, people. So in. yeah, it, it always seems possible that there's always something that trumps the larger humanitarian concerns. The better angels of our nature, mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln would say, it's always maybe the economy stupid, right? The war yeah. is going to end. We know that the spending is going to stop. We may be slipping mm -hmm. back into depression. There's going to be lots of unemployment now. Mm -hmm. All true, and maybe we don't want to do that. But I think at the end, you have to ask a much deeper question about who are we, what kind of people. Um, I'd like to know a lot about those 5%, you know, mm -hmm. that understood, you know, is mm -hmm. to me there, there are moments uh, more recently, and it always makes me cry, which is in Billings in 1993 in Billings, Montana, some idiot threw uh, a rock through the uh, front window of a family that had displayed a menorah. And the Billings newspaper, I don't know what it's called, printed a full page picture of a menorah. I can't imagine there were more than five you could buy right. in downtown Billings. And people, Christians, put up thousands of menorahs in their, mm -hmm. in their windows. And that is that 5%. Mm -hmm. And we're interested in, in both understanding that those people exist. The Varian Fry, right. a writer in New York who goes and works with a vice council in southern France, Hiram Bingham the mm -hmm. to rescue Jews. You know, mm -hmm. famous ones, Max Ophel, you know, Marcel Duchamp, yeah. Piet Mondrian, but also so-called ordinary people. Mm -hmm. And that there are all these committees and people working yeah. anonymously, but there is a huge part of us mm -hmm. not sensitive to the plight that have mm -hmm. bought into in some way, shape or form, some degree of the sense of an other. And that we, we're not all part, there's only, you know, Madison Grant is wrong. There's only one race, the human race. And that's the only distinction we have between, that's it, just human beings. Yeah. And, and there are people like Eleanor Roosevelt, her mm -hmm. famous, Frida Kirchway uh, from The Nation magazine, others who get it and understand mm -hmm. what this is about and others that don't. And it may just be as simple as, I'm worried about my job and that's mm -hmm. why I'm not. Or it may be the fact that those elements of anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. of racism, of nativism, of xenophobia have been here and will always be right. here and will manifest itself in some portion of the population. I, yeah. I, I think there's, I agree with everything Ken said. I think there's one other piece that I think about and it, it ties into this looking away is that it's a paradox, right, that we've seen millions of people dehumanized and treated as less than human and exterminated, killed and tortured and just everything. And then when you see the pictures, it can double down on the dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. And so it can evoke sympathy, but it can also evoke revulsion right. and horror. And, you know, all it's a very complicated thing that's going on here. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, it's it's horrendous and we, we are it's a tragedy and we, we feel sad. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, like do we really want the people that we've just seen staggering around skeletal and yeah. brutalized to come here? Right. You know, and, and so I, it it's it's very complicated, not to mention the layers of anti Semitism and othering that's already mm -hmm. happened that allowed this to happen in Germany and, and all the places that Hitler conquered. You, that toothpaste is out of the tube mm -hmm. and getting it back is really a long process. Mm -hmm. And so that's the work we're trying to do as a nation, right? Is mm -hmm. reckoning with all the things Ken is saying and to kind of give people, restore people's humanity when it has, the whole point was to take it away from them. And then the other piece is the Cold War. So mm -hmm. we did let in a lot of refugees right. after this, right? Mm -hmm. And the switch flips really quick and all of a sudden Germany's not the enemy Right. The communists are the enemy, and we let in a lot of refugees from Latvia, Lithuania, mm -hmm. who are displaced people. So it's not like we won't let in any refugees. Right. We let in quite a lot, but not the Jewish refugees. And Truman has to intervene to get in maybe 50, 60,000 Jewish refugees after right. the war. So, you know, this is, it's, there's just, there are a lot of layers to this, mm -hmm. and we're still trying to figure out exactly what's going on. I think that's a hugely important point about the dehumanization means that the same opacity that we relate to the notion of six million, which right. is an impossible thing, those bodies also become, those emaciated figures become kind of something that you can't deal with. And right. what's important, what, what, what engages the human heart and human sympathy mm -hmm. and human action is a sense that they live a life 
as real as mine, okay. that they care about their existence the way you and I care about our existence. Mm -hmm. And that is a, is a step that is still to be taken by a majority of human beings in mm -hmm. this world. And that's, I think, why we have literature, that's why we have art, mm -hmm. why we have um, the ideals that we have. And they're, you know, we're, we have not lived up to them. But that has to be what you want to aim for. Mm -hmm. There ought to be coming out of this a sense that, you know, as messy and as kind of screwing up as they are, democracies are the way to go. Authoritarian mm -hmm. governments kill more of their own people, but by, by far, mm -hmm. by ma by exponential magnitudes than than do democracies. And that freedom uh, to vote and citizenship are a very meaningful thing because in fact at the heart of this the heart of the dehumanization mm -hmm. is taking people who were s human beings right. and saying they first were not citizens and therefore not entitled to any protections of any state right. and therefore we are now free yeah one of the things that is amazing in in the opening scene when you're talking about otto frank his family had been in Frankfurt since the 17th century or 16th, oh, 16th century. century. Yeah, which is kind of amazing to you know think of. Well, there's generations of Germans who are Jewish right. who think of themselves as German first. Sure. And yeah. they're not you know, practicing Judaism in a very serious way right. and, and their identity is as Germans. Right. But unfortunately, this story shows they don't get to choose. That's right. Um, so to pull it back to the immigration question, um, you know, it seems like after World War II, uh, um, among other things, uh, world war, fighting in World War II kind of granted uh, uh, equal status for many immigrant groups. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, my grandparents were Italian and Irish. Uh, they were fully American after World War II mm -hmm. because they sent sons, you know, to yes. fight. Um, and you have people like John F. Kennedy in the late 50s published a book called A Nation of Immigrants. This was the narrative that I grew up with. I think we all did that, you know, somewhere, and it served a Cold War purpose, but it was also describing basic reality. We are a nation of immigrants. Everybody comes here, and that makes America stronger. That narrative does not seem to hold anymore. Uh, we don't talk about immigration, I, or I guess there's paradoxes going on. That's right. Ronald Reagan in the late 80s passed or signed off on legislation that grant you know immediately created uh, hundreds of thousands of legal citizens mostly of mexican uh descent who had been illegal um you know that's good that was he he was very pro-immigrant yeah. um the percentage of the foreign-born population continues to grow 1970 was the low point in terms of the census so there are more foreign-born people here there is more anxiety about immigration in the 90s. The California, California uh, Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives voted uh, on Prop 187 to you know, ban aid to illegal immigration. It was widely seen and I think properly understood as uh, anxiety over immigrants, yeah. uh, you know, the, the dusky, duskification right. of California. Donald Trump you know, rose to prominence by talking about building ending world. immigration, right? Illegal and illegal. And at the same time, Gallup finds historic highs of people saying immigration is good for the country, even as first Trump and even Biden now have reduced immigration. Um, how do we deal with this and how does this tie into the larger themes of you're serious. I, I think it's a really important question. And one thing that I've been thinking about, which is not just an American story, which is this, the ideology that Hitler took to the worst potential, horrible conclusion, you know, de demonized a certain group of people, mm -hmm. Jewish people and other people too. But that ideology is still with us mm -hmm. and different groups can get slotted in. And mm -hmm. there's been this sort of the, the far right or the neo-Nazi or the mm -hmm. alt-right, whatever words we want to use, basically have kind of substitute immigrants mm -hmm. for Jews in different ways. So there's, yeah. you know, that's a powerful thing and that's happening in Europe. We see it all over Europe, mm -hmm. fear of immigrants and demonization and scapegoating. And I mean, they right? sadly, I mean, they don't have Jews to blame anymore, right. but now they immigrants. can say it's, you know, Can I, can you I just know. go back so, and take a yeah. little longer view because yeah. it's the central question, mm -hmm. I think of our conversation, which is the Johnson Reed Act did not address immigrants from the Americas. It right. was presumed exactly. that 
the people in the Americans, mostly Mexicans and right. Central Americans, would cross the American border mm -hmm. for agricultural purposes right. and go back, right? What was interesting is that the corrective to the Johnson-Reed Act in 1965 uh, suddenly placed limitations yeah. on those from the Americas while it was right. liberating the Johnson-Reed yeah. Act of its pernicious quotas. Right. And uh, so, LBJ called it, the, we were writing a cruel and enduring wrong. Right. Now, it did but, not say anything yeah. about refugees, and it put on the problems. Yeah. Uh, it, I, I think it put on the Mexican and Central American and the American right. stuff, stuff that I think set the seeds for what's going on now. Yeah. I don't think we would have all of these problems or perceptions mm -hmm. had had we just understood our relationship right. to the Americas. You know, right. it's a kind of um, a different kind of Monroe right. doctrine that got kind of obliterated as we began yeah. to be concerned yeah, way, once again othered. with an othering. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, you said dusky, you know, yeah. that, that brown people suddenly didn't seem to be as American right. as anybody else. And so, I mean, it's very complicated and yeah. I oversimplified it a lot or coming for the reasons of the brutality right. of dictatorships there and the poverty and the gang violence and mm -hmm. wish to come into the American system where they would enjoy much more freedom and privileges and support. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, a lot of the, the fears are understandable. The problem is always in the othering. Mm -hmm. We don't see this as humanitarian issue. We see it as a political issue. We see this as them, not us. Humanitarian issues become all of our responsibility. Mm -hmm. And that's where I go back to that post-war 5% wanted to let in more refugees. You get, sort of have to begin with that 5%, and I don't know how you build a, a majority, but it's absolutely necessary for us to advance in a humanitarian fashion. And don't we also see that it's incredibly potent politically? People have made mm -hmm. careers on this. So it's striking into something that's very deep, mm -hmm. and doesn't, whichever the group is that's being demonized and othered, mm -hmm. other people are gaining power by doing that. So, you know, that, that there's a dynamic, a very long standing dynamic that we saw going back to the, like Benjamin Franklin to now. Mm -hmm. So the laws and the policies shift, but that, that sort of, that process the path, endures. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the lowest common denominator, right. that path of least resistance is right. to demonize the other. And it, I mean, when yeah. you listen to Father Coughlin, it doesn't sound too different than what you hear on, on some radio programs or some TV shows. The virulent anti-Semitism in his case is replaced by an anti-immigrant Mexican in another place or whatever it might be, or in fact, rising anti-Semitism again. The ADL reports that the level of anti-Semitic incidents is at the same level it was in the 1930s. We're going to leave it there. Ken Burns, Lynn Novick, thanks for talking to Reason about the U.S. and the Holocaust. Thank you. Thank you.